Good morning, everyone. Merry, Merry Christmas. It's a great way to start your Christmas season by turning into God's Word. Today, we're going to read the Christmas story on Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah? For a ruler will come from you, who will be the shepherd for my people Israel? Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. This is the reading of God's word. Good morning. I want to welcome you to our service today. It is Christmas Eve day. What a joy that is. And so uh, to you and all your wonderful friends and relatives, I wish you a very Merry Christmas and a joyous season right now that we're in. <clears throat> and uh, it's all possible because Jesus came and was born for us. Today's topic is more than a quest. And it's part of our series entitled More Than a Holiday. So today, we're going to look at this wonderful quest that the Magi had birthed in their heart. Another scripture that I like to refer to is Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6. It says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is the name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Our text today is a wonderful one, and it comes out of Matthew chapter 2, and it's verses 1 and 2. And those are my verses for my text today. And it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. What a glorious thought that is. It's a Christmas classic by now. The children's story written by Dr. Zeus, entitled How the Grinch Stole Christmas. As you know, everyone who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot. But the Grinch who lived just north of Whoville did not. It could be that his head wasn't screwed on quite right. It could be perhaps that his shoes were too tight. But I think the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was just two sizes too small. The story is really about the Grinch who didn't steal Christmas at all. He stole the trees, the gifts, the food, the stockings, the lights, and all the greenery he could grab. He took the popcorn, the plums, and every last drop of Whoville pudding by the time the Grinch returned to his wickedly lonely home on top of the mountain, overlooking Whoville, he, all he left behind was the snow, some hooks on a wall, a speck of food so small that the Whoville mice couldn't even use it, and turned his nose up at it. But much to his surprise, the Grinch left one thing behind. He somehow, some way, left Christmas 
in Whoville. When the good folks of the village woke up on Christmas morning, they joined hands in the street and sang their song, Christmas songs, as if that didn't matter, that the gifts were gone, the food was missing, and that the decorations had been stolen. High on his mountain fortress, it puzzled the Grinch to no end to realize that despite all his work, despite all his evil intent, he hadn't stolen Christmas at all. He had simply missed it. And the Grinch, with his Grinch feet ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or tags. And he puzzled three hours till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas means something a whole lot more. And what happened then, well, in Whoville, they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And the minute his heart didn't feel quite so tight, he whizzed with his load through the bright morning light. And he brought back the toys and the food for the feast. And he himself, the Grinch, carved the roast beast. <clears throat> more than a quest. Here in our wonderful story, we have the sage, the star, and the savior. We have also three examples of three attitudes. Herod's attitude was one of rage and furor. The chief priest and scribe was one of indifference and apathy. And the magi's was one of adoration and heartfelt worship. The first mighty question that bursts out of the New Testament for all ages is this amazing question. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? It's an outstanding question, for it stays with us even today. Is that your question this morning? It should be, friends. I hope it is. For it's the question a wise man or wise woman would be asking. The light of Christ's advent dawned in the days of hardship, deep darkness, in a time of chronic chaos and woe. The prophet Zechariah prophesied of his glorious coming to give light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death. Luke 1, 78, 79. That's where God's people found themselves that first Christmas sitting in darkness and bitterness in the shadow of death. But a light had dawned. They dwelled in deep darkness. Jesus didn't come to a world already alight with comfort and joy. He came to a bring peace to a war-torn world. Christ came to bring peace and true comfort to a world distressed and distraught, says John Piper. He came to announce good and glorious news of great and resounding joy, to bring good news to the poor and comfort the brokenhearted, as it says in Isaiah 61. To those drowning in a sea of sorrows, he came as a light, radiant and lustrous, in a world of weariness and woe. It is easy for us to simply overlook the deep darkness of those days. Consider the scandal of Mary with the Christ child unwed, the shock of Joseph discovering his pregnant wife to be the swirl of accusations, the torrent of gossip, the buzz of slander, the fake news and great conspiracy theories which must have abounded around her in, this, in her small town. The Magi came from a palace to the indignity of a manger. They came from a palace to a, an Alcazar of amazement, actually, to a chateau of cheer, to a mansion of magnetism. In glorious charisma, the world couldn't comprehend or envision. Traveling by the star in a world of suffocating darkness, they followed the star to see the light of the entire world. King Jesus, who is the light of the world. For the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not comprehended or overcome it, says the Gospel of John. The tide turned on his arrival. Light dawned. A new day burst forth, as it would say in Isaiah 9. To those who sat in great darkness, a light has dawned says Isaiah 9, 2. The king of kings was here in the living flesh. 
Later, Jesus would call his followers to walk in his light, for he himself would say, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Friends, while we sit in darkness, he makes us lamps of light, of this glorious light for others. He says, I am sending you to open their eyes. 1 Thessalonians 5.5 5. Do you know that the word Advent actually means coming? The coming of the glorious one. Yes, or the Advent of Christ, the anointed one, would do amazing things as the prophet Isaiah would foretell 700 years before his actual coming. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of despair, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, entered the world of mankind, the Messiah, the Son of the Covenant, the Lamb of God, the Lord our righteousness, was here. Did you know that the truth he brought us is intended to make a very different you and I? For the birth of King Jesus was a holy invasion, a benevolent takeover of heaven sent love and grace, whereby everyone and everything in the world must be transformed. The greatest teacher ever to cross the horizon of the world was here in the flesh. The King of heaven, the King of glory, had arrived. He did not lose his divine attributes, such as his omnipresence, which means he is able to be present everywhere at once, he, or lose his omnipotence, which means his all-powerfulness, or omniscience, all-knowing. Everything that can be known, he knows. He laid aside these attributes and many others for a time, and we call this the kenosis, meaning self-emptying. In other words, he made himself nothing. Friends, did you hear me? He made himself nothing to follow the Heavenly Father's divine will. He emptied himself and came to a manger of swaddling clothes. A ruler of Israel, the king of the Jews, was deity in diapers. A light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of Israel. His name was Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. Galatians tells us, in the fullness of time he came, born under the law, and yet a son of the law, the son of man and the son of God, the son of the Most High, to redeem those who are under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. He was born in Bethlehem in the Judea in the days of Herod. Behold, wise men from the east came into Jerusalem saying, where is he? Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. From Babylon and Bedlam, from tumult and turmoil to Jerusalem, the holiest city in Judaism, the ancestral and spiritual homeland of the Jewish people. Jerusalem was considered the center of the world. Even Ezekiel will say, this is Jerusalem. I have set her in the midst of the nations and countries all around her a place where God resided. They came here to God's chosen people saying, where is he? Where is he? With the mighty question burning in their hearts, where is he? This is the critical question of all time, the question that spans the generations. It was their question. It was the question of the ages. It's the question for today. This was a quest with a question. Friends, is it your question? Is it your question? Three points this morning. Who were the Magi? The Magi's inquiry and the Magi's motivation. First, who were the Magi? They were wealthy, powerful men, powerful figures in the world of their day. 
who traveled an inconvenient distance to honor Jesus. The visit of the Magi stirs our curiosity, uh, but also reveals the importance of honoring Christ, no matter how much effort it takes. Their number. In the second century, a church father named Tertullian suggested that these men were kings because the Old Testament had predicted that kings would come to worship him. He also concluded that there would be three kings based on the number of gifts mentioned, the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. Their class. The term magi is very interesting, for these men belong to a caste of people known as magi, or wise men. The term could be specific, says a professor named Dr. Jane. The ancient magi were a hereditary priesthood of the Medes, credited with profound and extraordinary religious knowledge. After some magi who had been attached to the Median court proved to be expert in the interpretation of dreams, Darius the Great established them over the state religion in Persia. It was in this dual capacity whereby civil and political council was invested with religious authority that the Magi became the supreme priests and the state religion of Persia, possessing great political power. One of the titles given to Daniel was Rab Mag, the chief of the Magi, or Master Magian. Daniel apparently entrusted a messianic vision and messianic prophecies to the Magi for its eventual fulfillment. Both the Persian and Jewish nation had regained their independence. The Jews under the Maccabean leadership and the Persians as the dominating ruling group within the Parthian Empire. It was at this time that the Magi and their dual priestly and governmental office composed the upper house of the Council of the Magistrates. And this is the term we get magistrates or judges whose duties included the absolute choice and election of the king of the realm. It was therefore a group of Persian Parthian kingmakers who entered Jerusalem in the latter days of the reign of Herod. Herod's reaction was one of alarm and fear when one considers the background of the Roman and Parthian rivalry that prevailed during his lifetime. They came from modern day Iran or Iraq you see, the Parthian Empire occupied all of Iran, Iraq, Armenia, parts of Turkey, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, and Tajikistan. It was a huge empire. <laughs> they were probably Zoroastrian in nature, monotheistic. They had some knowledge of Yahweh, but were not well schooled in the Old Testament. The shepherds represented the weak and the poor the Magi represented the rich and powerful. So we see that Jesus Christ is the savior of all who will receive him. Next, the Magi's inquiry. Where is he? Is that your question today? Maybe it's who is this? Found in Isaiah 63, one. Who is this who comes from Basra with dyed garments? The one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, mighty to save. Let me say that even today, wise men and wise women will still seek him. Are you seeking him? So what are people truly seeking? Fame, the world's pat on the back, celebrity status, or the caress of the world? Someone has said that the most common mistake now in this 21st century is seeking an experience rather than seeking the savior. To fall in love with God is the greatest thing in the world, as St. Augustine would say, and I quote, to fall in love with God is the greatest romance, the greatest adventure, to find him the greatest human achievement. For you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless till it finds its rest in thee. Blaise Pascal would say, if God exists, not seeking God must be the gravest error in the entire world. Friends, stay seeking him while you can. Don't frit away your life. Seek him like the Magi did. And they strove forward with an unchanging purpose, with a hungering desire and eagerness for the truth. Choices, you know, always lead somewhere. And the choice of the Magi to follow the star led to the feet of Christ. Even David said, early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My soul longs for you 
in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. What are we seeking? What are you and I seeking this Christmas? Thirdly, the, Madla, the Magi's motivation. These Magi weren't distracted or diverged by decoys and allurements. Their deliberate mandate never diminished. Solomon said, I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently will find me. It's not just what are you seeking, but who are you seeking? What captures your heart? King David said that those who know your name will put their trust in you. For Lord, you have not forsaken those who seek you. Because the Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand who seek God. Psalm 14, 2. Yes, the young lions will lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. David would say it best when he says, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for thee, O God. My soul pants for the living God. When shall I come and appear before you? What is your motivation? What's your catalyst of celebration? Do you know pursuing God is always rewarded? We're told in 1 Chron Chronicles 16 to seek the Lord in his face forevermore. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14, it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. We're told in James even to draw near to God and he will draw near to us. And even in Jeremiah 29, 13, it says, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Another common mistake, you know, today is that we look for God in the wrong places. A miracle was in progress as the Magi traveled and tromped the desert. Their desire grew. The passion for God inflamed their hearts. Yet when they entered God's capital city, the wonderful city of God, the city of righteousness. The city was to make glad the world of men, it says in Psalm 46, because the river of righteousness was flowing into it. The religious elite were spiritually sleeping, sleeping in apathy and snoozing in sin. And the prevailing secularism, the Pharisees with their purity and holiness code, the Sadducees with their social connections with the aristocracy, the scribes who copied the royal manuscripts, the Essenes who withdrew from the world. They didn't want to be part of it anymore. The zealots who were zealous for a righteous cause, Herod the king himself, were all spiritually sleeping. Who was alive and alert? Who was alive and alert to the coming of God's only begotten son? These scholars could tell these magi the tale of the text on the very place of his birth, but none were seeking the king of the Jews except wise men from the east. Herod was upset. He was troubled, as it says in our text. And this word troubled means clamor, tumult, unsettled, thrown into confusion. That was the state of Herod's heart. And he was enraged by this new intruder into his kingdom. It says, he and all Israel were in clamor or in troubled because of him. There is an abiding truth here. They or these magi find God in a chaotic, clamor-filled world. They didn't let the trouble stomp them out or derail their quest. They didn't let the peril of indifference keep them from seeking him. Here is another truth that God is available for those who seek him. So you and I can find him. The truth birthed and the Magi's heart fired their imagination and inspired their seeking. Braving the fierce sandstorms, they trudged on. Onward and upward they went. Onward with a quest for God. Friends, you just can't say no to wonder. Aching and throbbing in their hearts to find him was the quest of the King of Kings. Straining their way forward, choking over the swirling sand and bombing their mouths with gnashing winds and scorching heat. Onward they went, inching across the dunes of sand to find hearts encrusted with unbelief in Jerusalem, braving the cold nights 
under starlit skies to find souls colder than the night, seeking him while finding trouble and turmoil, discord and disbelief. Well, isn't that our world? Lunging into the swirling winds, they press towards the prize. Even St. Paul said, I press onward toward the goal to win the prize, which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. The prize of faith and hope, the Apostle Paul says, is to run for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Well, they were rewarded richly for their faith. We see it even today, masses of people, swarms of people from across all cultures are asleep and ignorant of the glorious gospel and its vital and heart-saving truth. There needs to be an alarm sounded for the unconverted. Gee, King Jesus can be your king now. Are you looking for him? Are you looking for him? He's available for you. Give him your life now. Why not? Friends, in a world of Caesars, in a vicious world, a world of unsteadiness, a world of woe, a world with its economy in spasms, a world of oppression at its highest peak, Jesus came. And at that very moment, into this strife-filled world, torn with struggle and splintered with sorrow and suffering, a war-torn world. It's in this world, yes, that the Magi sought and worshipped him. But praise God for his indescribable gift. So maybe, friend, you've come a long way, a long way in ruin, a long way in suffering, a long way in discouragement. I'm here to tell you, keep your hunger, keep your passion, keep your yearning, and keep the faith. Keep hungering for God. Stay alive and alert. Friends, the seeds of liberty grew in the Magi's hearts. In their hearts, they carried the greatest cargo that has ever traveled across a desert. The idea that they, yes, they, were going to meet a king of righteousness. Meet the king of the ages. A ruler with an impeccable record of holiness, humility, and honor. Worship and wonder. The greatest goods ever transported across the sand in hearts of beating flesh. Their will inflamed. Their conscience lit for God's great glory. The radical idea that they were going to see a king of wonder compelled them. This was a precious gem greater than the Oppenheimer Blue Diamond, the greatest Magna Carta, the wonder that conquered their passion and hearts. The seeds of truth were birthed in their hearts and they were on the way to see the king of heaven's glory alive in the flesh. Their declaration, you know, still stands even today in this 21st century. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Was not their only declaration. It was the constitution which catapulted them across the storm and the struggle. What's caught catapulting you today through the storms and struggles of life? Is it Jesus? I hope it is. Friends, seek him and keep seeking him. Keep on seeking him. When they saw him, the polarity of the power of God in helpless flesh was more wonderful, more amazing than the mighty star of wonder that lit up the entire cosmos. In conclusion, they did the very best thing. They fell down in humility, fell down with honor, being bestowed to him and worshiped him and adored him with heartfelt adulation and joy of their hearts. Friends, what are you falling for today? Yep, what are you falling for today? Because so many people are falling for everything but Jesus. I hope it's King Jesus, the lover of your soul. They gave the very best they had to give. They gave gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It says that they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy in Matthew 2, 11. Well, it doesn't say in the Bible to rejoice in the Lord always. It started with a question, where is he? And when these wise men, you know, they traveled some 1,500 miles or more with this question, where is he, burning in their hearts. This was a fervent inquiry, a catechism all of its own, offering its own exam to their souls. It propelled them forward with a star guiding and steering them. Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For this was no ordinary king, and this was no ordinary question. Jesus, our Emmanuel, 
is our King of Kings, heaven's only born King sent for you and I. Today, I'm gonna to ask you this question, is he your King? The Magi were intent to seek him and in seeking they were abundantly rewarded. For in seeking they found and encountered him. For it says, seek and ye shall find, Jesus said, and they did. Have you found heaven's only king? Matthew writes that when the wise men had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. Shouldn't that be our desire? To travel this world in faith and worship, to transit this world in faith and worship, going on a junket of joy. The quest of their faith wasn't extinguished with a pandemic of evil or abuse or horrible cruelty of man. Herod was full of power, prestige, and paranoia. The wise men were full of praise and perseverance and godly passion. This year, we need Christ's advent more than ever. What's the driving question of your heart and soul right now? Right now? Well, receive him into your heart and worship him as the Magi did. Worship him with the frankincense of your joy, the myrrh and with pearls of your tears and the gold of your love for him. He's still the king and he's still worth seeking. His invitation still stands and it's available now for he says, come to me. You know, he was the Messiah for the Magi. Is he your Messiah? Because when you found the king, you found everything. This Christmas, friends, don't be a worship spectator. Be a worship participant. God bless you and Merry Christmas. I wish you the very best Christmas. God bless you and all the best for the coming year. God bless you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to just dive into this story and see the wonder of these wise men traveling incredible odds across incredible distances to fall at the feet of Jesus. Oh Lord, may we do the same. May we do the same. May we never get tired of coming to church. May we never get tired of meeting with you. May we never get tired of going over the obstacles to get to your feet, to meet with you and to fellowship with you and to hold a conference of wonder with you. We ask Lord that you would inspire us this Christmas to go out of these doors, wherever we are, and to share the good news of Jesus, that he has come. And we thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.